Today, we'll take a look at some interesting cases of mental illness portrayed through art. But first, let me just say that I will not go over the more famous cases like Van Gogh, Monk, and Goya, since there are multiple videos and resources on them already. Secondly, this video will not necessarily look at these artworks through the common lens of portrayal of everything related to the concept of mental illness being presented as disturbing, dark, and terrifying. The general feel may tend towards discomforting representations, and the extreme cases are for sure interesting, especially from the perspective of an inquiry of the nature of the mind. But not all of them comply with these stereotypes, and a few can even be wholesome and cathartic. So, from schizophrenic self-portraits and illustrations about depression, all the way to music about dementia, here are five art projects about mental disorders. In 2017, Polish artist David Planeta managed to channel his fight with depression through digital art in the form of his series Mini People in the Jungle. This collection depicts a small figure adventured in the unknown, portrayed mostly as a jungle, and usually in the face of ominous animals and strange beings with glowing eyes. This art can look dark and mysterious, but it can also be rewarding. As the artist explains, this represents a story of a man descending into darkness and chaos in search of himself. He describes depression as a defense mechanism that activates when you do something that hurts you for a long period of time. It takes away your energy to stop you from doing it. All I knew is that my happiness was gone and I couldn't find joy in anything anymore, he said. That is, before a gentle feeling of excitement appeared after creating these images. He often puts quotes alongside each illustration, as he said, to work as hence to turn our minds in a specific direction and help to interpret the work within a certain mental landscape or mindset, continuing the story, helping it expand, not too far nor too close to the message of the picture. They must complete each other. In 1946, the superintendent of England's psychiatric Nethern Hospital, Dr. Eric Cunningham Dax, invited artist Edward Adamson to initiate art programs for hospitalized patients. He later moved on to Australia and established art therapy in psychiatric hospitals there. And years later, after continuing to gather creative works, he opened in Melbourne the Dax Center collection with more than 15,000 psychiatric artworks. All of this with the mission of promoting mental well-being by fostering a greater understanding of the mind, mental illness, and psychological trauma through art and creativity. In fact, 10,000 visitors to the collection were surveyed after reviewing exhibits, and 92% of respondents agreed that the artworks helped them have a more sympathetic understanding of the suffering of people with mental illness, as well as a better appreciation of their ability and creativity. One artist featured in the exhibits was Joan Rodriguez. She had been interested in art from an early age. She completed a course in art, worked as a graphic artist, was married and had two children. But following postpartum depression, she became ill for four years. She took medication for anxiety, but eventually found that the creative process granted some control over her mental state. She later said that art making is a powerful personal tool for emotional survival and that her paintings express, quote, the silent cries of depression. Joan, influenced by Jungian psychology, painted underwater scenes to represent the unconscious and to explore her own depression and revive the expired feminine in her. Her painting, If Only Alcyone Would Awake, is said to be a call for herself to wake up and take charge of her life. It appeals to a story of Greek mythology about Alcyone, a princess who, after finding out that Zeus killed her husband out of anger, threw herself in grief into the sea and drowned, only to be later transformed alongside her husband into halcyon birds after the gods took pity in them. The painting indeed portrays the devoted princess sinking into the calm sea with her hair transforming into the bird's wings, symbolizing the reestablishment of calm. Also among the artists was Graham Doyle. He was an artist and performer from Melbourne with a Bachelor of Fine Art and a Graduate Diploma of Painting. At 18 years of age, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and later described himself as, quote, a grim survivor with extraordinary courage. Doyle proudly considered himself an outsider artist. He unflinchingly portrays the isolation, the vulnerability, the stigmatization, 
exclusion and the physical toll he has experienced in his long-term struggle with mental illness. In his self-portrait and other paintings, the Dax Center reports, Doyle depicts faces and forms jumbled together in seemingly limitless arrays of combinations, evoking a sense of self in a state of continual mutation and a deep ontological uncertainty in which apparently no fixed or stable identity can ever be arrived at. One of his paintings depicts a garden scene whose calm is disturbed and haunted by a huge demon-like face in the background. This provides insight into Doyle's inner world. It reminds him of the psyche and of death. His work was central to his mental health. It was therapeutic and clinical. He said that he put, quote, his kilowatts of suffering into it. And in spite of this, I think the best quote of his I can leave you with is, I've taken more of schizophrenia than it's taken from me. At this point, Charnley's 1991 self-portrait series are somewhat well known. They tell the story of a trained artist who from the age of 18 suffered nervous breakdowns that were eventually diagnosed as acute schizophrenia. After a few years between periods of hospitalizations and treatment, he started painting again, and from 1982 onwards, in his own work he started to address his inner life, his dreams, his mental states, but particularly the nature of schizophrenia. A few of his paintings were sold and exhibited in the 80s and 90s, but this satisfaction was outweighed by the growing problems of his illness that eventually got him on heavy medication. After this, he started his final work, the famous self-portrait series. While experimenting with different dosages of medication and keeping a journal of it to help explain the imagery. This was in part inspired by Louis Vane's series of portraits of anthropomorphic cats that changed bizarrely, taking almost a psychedelic turn over the course of his life in mental institutions, due in fact to suspicions of schizophrenia. Charnley reported early on hearing voices and being paranoid due to his feeling of his thoughts being broadcasted to the outside for everyone to hear and judge. This was a very recurrent thing in his portrait series. He later reported having trouble with tobacco withdrawal, love, and talking to women, and he saw himself as the target of people's cruel remarks, with nails on the eyes because of everyone else's extrasensory perceptions, of which he was blind. The nail on the mouth expresses his social ineptitude, which made him a target, and his brain turned into a mouth because he felt his personality being broadcasted like the wavy lines in the background. After more references to heartbreak, anger, fear, and hallucinations, he got to his last two portraits, to which he left no descriptions whatsoever. One portrays what appears to be a connection of enemies, rivals, and the past, a strong feeling about hope with an apparent rejection of medications and nails in the past, as well as in the center line from Bob Dylan's series of dreams, the cards are no good that I'm holding unless they are from another world. His last portrait from July 19th is made up of mysterious brushes of red and yellow. Of his precise meaning, no one will ever be sure, because Charlie took his own life that same month of July. William Ottermolen was a figurative artist who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 1995. Although signs of his illness may be retrospectively apparent in his earlier works, like the conversation pieces, which depict him and his wife in their new house at the time in Little Venice. Apparently, as his wife recalled, in an attempt to fix in time and space forever the way they lived and their most intimate friends, all connected in some way to the arts. The thing is that gallerist and longtime friend Chris Boykos noted, quote, signs of the disease are made apparent in the shifting perceptions of space, objects, and people. They are premonitions of a new world of silence and sensory deprivation about to close in on the artist." End quote. However, things get a lot more interesting and tragic after his 1995 diagnosis of Alzheimer's, which is usually correlated with his painting Blue Skies, in which, it has been noted, the artist, sitting beneath the skylight in the studio where he worked, grips himself to the table in an attempt to avoid being sucked into the blue emptiness of the dreadful future that he suspected was around the corner. After he was taken to care in Queen Square Hospital in London, a nurse encouraged him to make self-portraits. Now, this was obviously not the first time he drew himself, but from here on in, his portraits weren't the same. In broken figure and in the studio self-portraits, the artist focuses on his physical decline. 
In Broken Figure, he draws the geometric shapes, giving us tests to patience, as well as scribbled lines that have been taken to represent failures of remembering lists of words given to him as memory tests. Little by little, he watches himself dissolve and become a fragment, a shadow of his former self. In 97, he paints self-portrait with saw, after finding out that it was only at autopsy, after his death, that is, that his doctors will be able to definitively diagnose his Alzheimer's disease. A year after that, he starts to struggle with oil paint, which lead to his frustration clearly portrayed in a raised self-portrait. This forced him to move on to draw with pencil, but as the months progressed, the same thing started to happen again until 2002, when Otter Mullen was no longer able to draw. He was sent to a nursing home in 2004 and died of pneumonia in 2007. The saddest part, according to his wife Patricia, was that, and I quote, by the end he couldn't even recognize his own paintings. To end with Otter Mullen, I'll leave you with another quote from his wife after his death. He died in 2007, but really he was dead long before that. Bill died in 2000, when the disease meant he was no longer able to draw. Everywhere at the End of Time is a huge project made by artist Leyland Kirby, who for this and other similar projects adopted the name of The Caretaker. It is a six hour long album about dementia, and it is divided into six stages, each getting progressively worse, mimicking the advancement of the disease. The original video description, to which you can find a link below, explains the whole gimmick. It goes from songs with names such as Things That Are Beautiful and Transient, through Last Moments of Pure Recall, all the way to stage 4 post-awareness confusions. Stage 5 advanced plaque entanglements. And much more. Each stage features a different cover made by visual artist Ivan Seal, whose paintings portray abstract distortions of normal objects urging a sense of strangeness and familiarity at the same time. It is no wonder then that his paintings work so well on the topic of advancement of dementia and the deterioration of the things that a person once knew. I'd recommend listening to this with headphones and trying as much as you can to listen to it all in one sitting, or at least listen to a few songs from each stage to get a good sense of each one. Listen in its entirety to the last song, Stage 6, Place in the World Fades Away. The ending is something unexpected but absolutely beautiful and tragic at the same time. It is definitely my favorite part. As some of you may know, a year and a half ago I made a cute little version of the first song of this album, and I guess some of you found it interesting. That was in fact my inspiration for making this. In the comments of that video I noticed how people were telling stories about loved ones they had lost to dementia, and how horrible the disease can be which motivate me to research some organizations to which you can actually volunteer or donate money to help with the fight against not only dementia but all kinds of mental disorders. Some are charities for support, but others focus on helping fund the research that goes into it. These illnesses may not have been figured out yet, but if that's ever going to happen, it will be through this research, and the more funding they have, the faster they'll be able to figure it out. All the links and references to this will be in the description. Finally. This video format was a bit different to what one might expect from this channel, so please be sure to let me know what you think of it, and stay tuned if you liked it, because I get a lot more coming soon. Until the next one.